Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Lord, and welcome to the second day of the 2020 North American Week of Prayer. Our theme for the week is a revived look, and of course that's a look at the Lord Jesus. The sub-theme for yesterday was Christ is Lord, and the sub-theme for today is Christ is Worthy. And within that theme, then, I've been tasked to have a look at Heaven Declares. So let's go immediately to the Word of God and let's go to the, the book of Hebrews and chapter 3. And I'd like to read several verses from there. So Hebrews 3 verse 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honour than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. Now what we have here is the Spirit of God by the writer of the Hebrews laying out an argument and the argument goes like this. Both the Lord Jesus and Moses were faithful in the house of God. However, the Lord Jesus was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Why? Because he built the house. And naturally, the house builder has more honor than the house itself. And then when we come to verse 4, we are informed that God has built all things. And that would include the house of God. And therefore, we are led to make the logical conclusion by the Spirit of God that if the Lord Jesus Christ built the house of God and God built the house of God, then the Lord Jesus is God. The, in other words, the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, is counted worthy of more glory than Moses because he is the builder of the house in which Moses was faithful and he himself is God. That's a wonderful, encouraging thing in these days because we are surrounded by folks in a world in which many of them just simply ignore the Lord Jesus Christ. Many are ambivalent towards the Lord Jesus Christ and many more deny his deity. Uh, they may give him some standing as a prophet or as a good man who did good works, uh, but they certainly don't attribute to him deity. And so the Spirit of God wants us to be absolutely clear, and he unreservedly uh, makes it clear in this argument through the author of Hebrews that the Lord Jesus Christ is very God. Now we saw in this little passage in verse 3 that the Lord was due to be counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Uh, but the truth is, as we look in the Word of God, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ is actually the glory of God himself. And so if we go to Hebrews chapter 1, and we look at the first three verses, uh, we will find a little bit of an explanation of this. Now, just before we do that, I just want to mention that as you go through the scriptures and you identify where glory is spoken of and it's immaterial, whether it is the glory of God or whether it is the glory of a person or whatever it might be, uh, there are three foundational elements or three primary elements uh, that make up glory. And I would suggest to you that you will find along the way that the three elements are, first of all, radiance. Secondly, you will find that it has to do with reputation or character. And the third element I would suggest is power. And so when we come to look at verses 1 to 3, uh, let's see if we see those elements there. So Hebrews 1, verse 1 says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, 
hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now notice this is a declaration of God himself. And the declaration is by his Son. And then it says that he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed the heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, that's radiance, and the express image of his person, that is reputation or character, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty and high. This is the one who is God. Uh, when we see the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the glory of God. Uh, the glory of God is revealed in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look at him in this passage, we see a number of things. First of all, God has appointed that he would be the heir of all things. All things are his. And uh, as time goes on and as the plan of God is worked out, then eventually, in actual fact and in practicality, all things will be given into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, as well as that, when we see the Lord reveal himself in the scriptures, he is often revealed in association with his creative power. And so we see it here, where it says that by the Son, uh, he, is, he is the one who created, he made the worlds. And then, as well as that, we see him as the Savior. And uh, in verse 3, it says that when he had by himself purged our sins, then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty and high. The Savior, the only one who could possibly have dealt with the sin problem and made rebels and enemies his friends and part of the family of God. And as well as that, we see him, as we note here, at the right hand of the majesty and high, indicating that the work has been done, the work of redemption, providing redemption, providing salvation, has been completed once and for all, and so the Lord has opportunity to sit down. But he's not inactive in sitting down. In fact, he is the head of the body, and he's the head of the church, and as well as that, he is interceding for us daily. What a saviour we have. And then let's go over to the book of the Revelation. And in chapter 4 and chapter 5, uh, again, we see tremendous worth being attributed to the Lord Jesus. We've seen that the Spirit has declared that he is God. We've seen that the declaration of the Father uh, is that he is the glory of God. He is the heir of all things. He is the creator. He is the savior. And today he's in the place of the finished work. But as we go into the book of the Revelation and we have a look in chapter 4, we see this wonderful scene in heaven and we see the triune God on the throne of heaven. And as, he is on, as God is on the throne, we see the seraphim and they come and they praise and they worship. And it says in verse 9 of chapter 4, when the seraphim, that's the beasts, give glory and honour and thanks to him that sat down on the throne who liveth forever and ever. When they did that, then something else happened. And the 24 elders representative of the church, uh, they also uh, came and they put their crowns at the feet of the one who was on the throne. And it says in verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. And then again, in keeping with the uh, instances of the revelation of the Lord, we have it associated with the creative power of God. And so it says, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That last phrase could be represented and by thy will they were and are created. So once again, we see 
the Savior, the second person of the Godhead, and in that capacity, as the Godhead sits on the throne, as uh, God is honored uh, by the seraphim and by the church, uh, we see this worth being attributed to God, and as the Lord is the second person of the Trinity, he shares in that attribution of worth. And then as we move into chapter 5, uh, we see a situation in which there is a scene being laid out in front of us. And in that scene, uh, there is no one worthy. In fact, in verse 2 it says, And I saw a strong angel, it's John who is speaking, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And this affected John deeply. And in verse 4 it says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And so we have this scene set where no one is worthy and it's setting the scene for one to appear who has overwhelming worthiness and of course we see him appear in verse 6 and I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain and so we see the Lord appear and he appears as that lamb as though it had just been slain and everything that goes from here on has to do and revolves around the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and when this lamb steps forward and will be proven to be the only one worthy to take the book and to open the seals all of heaven begins to praise and worship him and so in verse 9 it says, they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the, se the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. This is the qualifying uh, element. The Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his substitutionary sacrifice for sinners on the cross is the element that qualifies him to take the book and to open the seals. And so we see that he will do that. But it also tells us what was achieved as he was slain. And so it says, And has redeemed us to God <coughs> by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And so he is worthy. He's worthy because he was slain. It speaks of his substitutionary death. And the fact is that because of that death, he's worthy because he was able to bring sinners into a place of fellowship with himself, with God. And not only that, it is by his blood, by his shed blood, he has redeemed sinners, those who were his enemies, he has redeemed by his blood. And not only that, but he's worthy because he was able to take these redeemed ones and make them kings and priests. And also because of what he has done, he is worthy uh, because they will reign with him on the earth. And after this picture that we see here, we see that the myriads of those in heaven burst out into uncontrolled praise and worship. Uh, when I say uncontrolled, I don't mean chaotic. I mean it is the overflow of the heart of heaven in praising and worshipping this one who is the centre of all things and who was slain and who achieved so much in his sacrifice. And so in verse 11, it tells us that there are 10,000s upon 10,000s and thousands upon thousands in heaven. 
and they are going to praise and worship. The idea is that it's an innumerable company. They couldn't be counted. And it says in verse 12 that they are saying with a loud voice. That word loud in the Greek is megas. And in England, English it comes over as mega. And we talk about mega projects. And it means they're massive. And here John hears the massive voices, combined voices of heaven raised in praise and worship to our God, to our Savior. And here he is in the midst of all. He's always in the midst. And in the midst, he receives the worship of heaven. And look what he receives. It says in verse 12 that worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. If you count each of those up, you will come to seven. And I don't believe that's a mistake. Uh, we know that seven in the scriptures is the number of completeness. And I believe the Spirit of God has made sure that there were seven elements in this praise and worship to show that it was complete. There was nothing missing from it. It was absolutely everything that ought to have been attributed to this one who is worthy, worthy of all the praise, worthy of all the worship, and it is complete and it is good and it is right that he should receive it. Now, there's one other place in the New Testament where uh, the word worthy is used. In these passages, we've looked at where the word worthy is used. And there's one other place where it's used in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. But in that passage, it says that he is not worthy. And you can look that up for yourself. We'll not talk about it now, but you'll be thrilled for the reason he's not worthy. And you can look at it in Luke chapter 23 and verses 14 and 15. Now, in addition to the places where it specifically uses the word worthy of him, I believe that there are other passages, uh, of course, the scriptures are full of the worth of the Lord, uh, but there's other passages where his worth is demonstrated. And in one section or one area, I would suggest that in the time of his ministry from beginning to end, there is a recurring event that uh, attributes worth to him in the most tremendous way. And that is that at his baptism, the heavens opened and God the Father said, This is my beloved Son, of whom I am well pleased. And uh, then partway through his ministry, uh, Matthew records in Matthew chapter 12, the prophecy of Isaiah 41 and is saying that it is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. And that verse is uh, recorded as this, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. And so once again, even years before the Lord came to the earth, the Father was already saying, This is the one, my servant, in whom my soul is well pleased. And then, of course, we see the transfiguration towards the end of his ministry, and uh, you'll remember that he took several disciples to the Mount of Transfiguration with him. And during the time that they were there, once again, the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. What wonderful approbation from heaven. Heaven declares the worthiness of of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's worthy in his obedience. He's worthy as God. He's worthy to receive all things. He is worthy. And uh, there's one other time when uh, it is recorded in the New Testament when it talks about God speaking from heaven. And certainly up to this point, uh, the uh, gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have recorded that God spoke from heaven at the baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, but this one other time is an eyewitness account. 
And so Peter, who was on the Mount of Transfiguration when he wrote his epistles that we call 1 Peter and 2 Peter, in 2 Peter and chapter 1, he says, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honour and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I just want to mention one other passage. You'll remember in uh, <coughs> uh, Philippians, uh, a well-known passage, and many of you probably have it memorized. It talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus to the earth. He was in the form of God, but he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And he took on himself the form of a servant, etc. And he achieved wonderful things on the cross. It says he was found obedient and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And then again, we have the declaration of heaven. It says, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. From these passages that we have read together, uh, can you get the atmosphere of majesty, the atmosphere of worthiness, the obedience of the Savior, the work of the Savior, uh, that he is worthy of all glory and everything that can be attributed to him that is good and right and wonderful, that even heaven celebrates. This is our Savior. And these things encourage us and they excite us. Uh, but really, we can ask the question at this point, so what? So what? In other words, what are the implications if this truly is uh, our Savior? If this truly is the Lord Jesus Christ, what does that mean for us? And I would suggest, uh, just as we draw towards a close here, uh, I would suggest six things. And uh, these are not exhaustive. Uh, there could be many more added. But I would suggest that these things uh, are areas of examination, examination of our own personal lives and examination also of the life of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in North America today. In 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 11, we are told to examine ourselves before we come to the table. But I would suggest that examination of self not to put self down, but to see where we can improve is always a good thing. And so these six things that I want to mention, I would suggest that it might be a good idea, even though it sounds a little crass, uh, but to put a score of between one and ten on them as we examine ourselves. But also we're thinking of the church in North America as we come in prayer, of course, across the world, but more particularly here in North America and Canada and the United States. And I would suggest that these are also areas of examination for the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this day in which we exist. And so perhaps in your mind you can have two columns, one a personal column and one for the Church. And so I would suggest that these six things are things that are critical to our testimony and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the first one I would suggest is that as a result of what we have seen in the scriptures of him, that he is worthy of our love. In fact, he said it, didn't he? In John chapter 14 and verse 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now that is not a legalistic, I have to do it sort of attitude to the Lord. This is a response of the heart that's why he used the word love. If you love me, it's the response of the heart in which we obey him. And where do we figure on that scale? And where does the church figure on that scale in North America? 
And then secondly, I would suggest because of who he is, that he is worthy of our obedience. You know, there's a great commission, as we call it, at the end of Matthew. And uh, to my knowledge, that has never been rescinded and will not be rescinded until that day when the Lord comes to the air and takes us to be with himself. And I also don't see anything in the scriptures where it says, if it looks as though the times might be telling you that the return of the Lord to the air is soon, that you can slow down. I don't see that either. And so we have a command still in force to make disciples of the nations. How are we doing in that? What about our personal witness? How do we figure 1 to 10? And what about the church in North America? How do we figure 1 and 10? And then thirdly, I would suggest that because of who he is, we, he is worthy of our adoration. Now, once again, this brings us back to the response of the heart. Do we love him? Uh, not in this case to uh, just go out and serve him and keep his commandments, but in this case, to have that intimate relationship with him, that relationship of closeness and of love with him that is wonderful in itself and that we enjoy every day and we enjoy his presence and we know that we are in his presence and that he loves to have us there. Of course, the Song of Solomon epitomizes that with the love of the bride for the bridegroom. And uh, in chapter 4 and verse 1, we see that wonderful poetic uh, method in which Solomon lays it all out in his book. And it says there in the first verse, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. What wonderful poetic words that are an attempt to express the heart's love for the bridegroom. And you and I have a bridegroom uh, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is our heart and love relationship with him like? And then fourthly, I would suggest that he, because of who he is, is worthy of our best. In Colossians, Paul says, Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. And uh, very often, uh, it's very easy to give the Lord the less leftovers, isn't it? The leftover of our time, uh, the leftovers of our energies, the leftovers of our possessions, the leftovers of whatever he has endowed us with. And it's so easy to get to that place, but he demands all. He demands the best. He demands the best of our energies. He demands the best of our thinking. He demands the best of our attention to his service. And so, once again, where do we figure as far as that is concerned? And then, fifthly, I would suggest that he is worthy of our sacrifice. He said... Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, and he didn't stop there. He said, for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. How are we doing? Are we ready uh, on the altar, if you like? Isn't that the emphasis of Romans chapter 12 and the beginning of Romans chapter 12 that we are to be completely subject to him. The word subject sometimes carries a negative idea but that is the idea. It's only as we are submissive to the Savior and completely available to him that he can use us to the utmost to, come, to achieve his purposes and that we can bring honor and glory to him. He is worthy of our sacrifice. And then the last one I want to mention is he's worthy of our worship. Isn't that what we see in Revelation 4 and 5? That overflowing of worship. And that's what we're talking about here. When we meet with the people of God, are our hearts full? Do we prepare to meet and to bring glory and to bring praise and honor and worship to the Savior? And not only that, 
But is that the attitude and the, uh, and the reality of our hearts day by day? Uh, we don't have to worship only one day a week. Uh, that should be the overflowing reality of our hearts. And it's only as we understand him, as heaven understood him, and it's only as we appreciate him and see his worth as heaven sought that we will have that overflowing heart of worship. Let me say uh, that it would be wonderful if God would be pleased to answer our prayers and open the windows of heaven to pour out on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive, to use the words of Malachi, that he would revive us and that the world around might be exposed to the reality and the power of spirit-filled believers preaching Christ and salvation by the blood. Isn't it that revival of the church and the awakening of unbelievers that we need in our day? You see, all heaven declares the worth of the Lord Jesus. Ought not we, the people of the Lord, be better, more intense, more urgent in doing the same? Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time once again in the Word. And Lord, as we go to prayer this week, we pray, Father, that you would be pleased to hear and pleased to answer. Lord, we are jealous for thy name and for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are jealous that you would be honored and glorified in this world. And Father, we realize that in the church we need the reviving power of the Spirit of God. And Father, in the world around us, we need the awakening power of the Spirit of God in the hearts of men who need the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, as we come to you, we just come to you in his wonderful name, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.